Welcome to another episode of Fill in the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Evan. Hey yo. All right, howdy hell. <laughs> well, you know what we're here to talk about today, buddy? Seems interesting. Robert Liston. Okay, this is somebody I have been very fascinated about recently. I actually ordered the book from uh, Lindsay Fitzharris. Anybody out there that wants to know a little bit more about the art of butchery, please look up. Now, I'm not talking about butchery with your meat. I'm talking about <laughs> butchery of surgery is what they call it. Because basically, this is around the 19th century, uh, Victorian surgery. We're hearing things that are like, like things you wouldn't be even be able to believe. Did you know that actually Victory was a show back, or not uh, Victory, but Victorian surgery was a show back in the day? Like people would gather around the surgeon's operating table and it was known as like people would go and watch surgeries be performed. That was their source of entertainment. They had one hell of a culture. So I that... mean, how much money <laughs> does it cost to go see someone get his leg chopped off? Probably not that much considering. God. Well, Robert Liston, born the October 28th, 1794, and died on September, or not September, December 7th, 1847, was a pioneering Scottish surgeon. Liston was noted for his skill in the era prior to anesthetics, when spent made a difference in terms of pain and survival. Creator of the common medical tools used today, such as the Liston splint, a method of immobilizing the bone that was fractured, so that's where our... Uh, splints came from it was actually a robert liston invention and also the liston's knife that thin blade you see in a lot of surgery movies and stuff um this is two different blade edge knife commonly used today well before hygiene was big in 1847 liston cared about hygiene with clean tools at the time but he never soaked them in cold water because he didn't know the uh theory of germ theory where it's like you have to use hot water to get rid of the germs yeah he was just washing his tools because he liked them clean but it wasn't until his his uh, predecessor, Joseph Lister, they're not in any relation, but the guy before him, um, Joseph Lister, the guy that enveloped list, uh, Listerine, actually found a way to like get rid of uh, germ like, and became like very big in the whole using uh, anesthetics and all that in surgeries. Like became that whole development where you spray something and it kind of numbs the pain. Yeah. That was his all creation. Big chalk up to him. He didn't actually d develop Listerine. Um, some dude did it in honor of him because they got the idea from Joseph Lister. That's why they named it after him. That is fucking cool. Well, he was the, in his early life, he was the son of Margaret Ireland and a Scottish clergyman and the inventor Henry Liston, whose father, Robert Liston, was the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. His career, Liston received his education at the University of Edinburgh, became the first great Northern American autonomist of Blackwell's magazine, and in 1818 became a surgeon in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. In 1832 and 1833, he is listed as living at 99 George Street in the center of in the center of Edinburgh's new town. He lived from 1840 to 1847 at 5 Clifford Street off Bonbon Street in Mayfair and in a building area now of historical significance. Hence Richard Gordon's specific mention of his address in the section on Robert Liston. Yeah, they literally shouted out his address. So if anybody wants to go see the house where Robert Liston grew up, I would actually travel to Scotland to see this guy's house. To be 100% honest with you, I'm this fascinated about this guy. Dude, Edinburgh is the, like, like the prime location for large amounts of spooky duke, creepy, deepy bullshit. <laughs> Where is Edinburgh? It's That's it's one of the main towns in Scotland. Yeah, one of I the main... I feel like when it comes to, like, England and, like, those types of stuff, like, he was born in Scotland and died in England. Like, it seems like once they kind of... They have, like, the weirdest groups of people, like... You know what I mean? Yeah. Edinburgh, yeah, it crops up a lot through important events in history. I couldn't name a bunch, but... Well, Liston confronted a surgeon when he worked um, in the uh, with the infamous William and Burke uh, and William and Hare, who stole corpses from graves and sold them to uh, uh, anatomists. And oh, students. shit. So that's another topic we're definitely going to do. Um, the the Burke and Hare murders... Those people were stealing corpses from, like, graves 
and they were selling them to medical schools for them to practice on. Well, Burke and Hare, they were killing people yes. to well, sell. They ran out of bodies yeah. to steal, and they started killing people. And then, well, Jesus. Robert Liston has an actual confrontation with one of these people, which we're going to dive into a little bit more. So let's talk about Liston's legacy. Liston's legacy comprises both of that which is made into popular culture and what is found primarily within the medical fraternity and related dis disciplines. He was known to perform a surgery most doctors wouldn't do or gave up on their patients. Liston helped all and hated cowardice surgeons. That was one thing I wrote down about him that I thought was very beneficial because like a lot of people will be like, oh, that surgeon's, that surgery's too risky. I'm not going to perform it. He's like, give me that shit. I'm going to do it right now. Um, I remember one time, uh, I don't remember one time, I definitely wasn't alive around this, but I heard from Lindsay Fitzharris in her book, The Art of Butchery, which I want to give a shout out. It's on Amazon. It's only 17 bucks. Go out and buy it. Damn. Shout out to her. Cause it's such a good book. I usually don't give someone credit that much, but when you, I, I found this very, very interesting to hear about Victorian times and how far we've come as a, in medical experience. But, uh, you know, like he, this guy was like, he, he was just, cr it was crazy to think of all the mistakes and all this type of stuff. But to hear this guy, he cut out a mouth tumor out of this dude's mouth that looked like he had literally like a bowling ball in his mouth. Like his mouth was, jaw was like open, like a giant cyst in there. Dude, Chop Liston was the only one that would take that because everyone else, like the surgery, surgery is too risky. This guy's like, ah, 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 basically saying, can you help me? Like he can't talk because there's things in his mouth. Liston cuts it out, and he talks about it dropping in a bucket, and it makes it a <laughs> plop. And then they'd have a picture of the dude afterwards, and his face is skinnier than Abraham Lincoln. Like, his face is sucked in, looked like he was, like, like sucking on a sour warhead or something. Like his yeah. face is all puckered up. Because he had this giant thing in his mouth for so long. Giggity, giggity. But it's like, <laughs> it's crazy to think how, like, you got to think how that man probably felt. That man was probably like, thank you so much. This guy took the time to help me out. Like, that's something a lot of doctors, when they go above and beyond for their patients, like, shave their head for their patient because their patient got diagnosed with something. Like, that's something that it, it's, it stands in your heart, whether you're making a difference, in, you know. And not much to everybody else, but you're making a difference to that person. And I think that's what really counts. That kind of like like you were saying, like heroism in surgery and being a doctor and a medical professional. That people can learn from that in any area, well, not not just like medicine, but like it's just adopting that like human kindness, man. Yeah. Well, uh, Joseph Lister, another one I want to. Get, uh, I, I wish I could get him on the podcast, but no. <laughs> Another podcast I want to do on Joseph Lister. Like, he was known for, hey, like, he would treat his patients, not as patients, but he would ask, are you comfortable? Is, is there anything I can do for you? He would say these types of things. You know, Robert Liston, um, this the surgeon that we're talking about now, he was literally, like, big guy, 6'2", you know, like, crazy like back then they didn't have a lot of straps to hold you down when you're getting your leg chopped off without any medicine to yeah. numb the pain so you're freaking out he had one report of a dude getting up and running away from liston and liston broke down a door grabbed him and threw him back <laughs> onto the table and chopped this guy's arm off like he was like look we're doing this okay so i mean and i'm sure he he did it because it was going to save his life. Well, Lindsay... No matter if he didn't want his leg chopped off, like, fuck. Like, you're getting your leg chopped off yeah. or you're going to die and I'm not going to let you die. Well, so. back then they didn't know a whole lot about, um like, uh it, once you got shot or something, they later figured out that if they just leave the bullet in there, you're actually safer than getting the surgery. Because if you broke something, the first thing they usually did before, like, splints and all that were... You know, if your bone was poking out a little bit, you're basically dead because they had to, they were going to chop it off. Like, it's if it's something like that, like, oh, it's so much pain, you can't walk. Well, we got to chop it off. They're not even worried about the healing process. You know, hospitals back then were meant for the poor. Yeah. Um, you went to the hospital if you were poor. You would get sicker at the hospital. Um, where we talk about, like, you know, the hospital, like, now is, like, the sickest place you can go. You'd rather be safe in your own home. It's because you have your own bacteria in there, so you're able to use that. So if you're rich, you had a doctor come to you. To actually, um, you know, perform the surgery yeah. and stuff. And you know how bad that was that doctors didn't know about contamination. The bed, the people that make the, um, that kill bugs and stuff in beds. Yeah. They got paid more than the doctors. Yeah. 
Like that's how ridiculous it is. And that's all from, like I said, I'm going to keep giving her a shout out. Lindsay Fitzharris, go look at her book. It's very amazing. I got it on the way from Amazon, so I'm ready. Um, so let's talk about in 1837, he published Practical Surgeries, arguing the importance of quick surgeries. These operations must be set out about with determination and completed rapidly. Liston's image was preserved in both bust and portrait form. Following Liston's death, a meeting was held by his friends and admirers who unanimously resolved to establish some public and lasting testimonial to memory of his distinguished surgeon. A committee of some 78 people were formed, which resolved the testimonial um, should consist of a marble statue to be placed in some designated spot and the inauguration of a gold medal to be called the Liston's Medal and awarded annually as the Council of Universities College may decide. Even though um, history shows a serial killer, he cared truly for his patients by uh, postponing surgeries if the afflicted was having second thoughts and might need time for reassurance. He also would tell them the weirdest thing, which is like, um, if a woman's like, I'm nervous about having this surgery coming up, she knows she has to get her arm chopped off or knows she has to get something done. Uh, He'd be like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back, but I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to come back. And it's like, <laughs> oh, my God. Like, that's really going to freak me out. You're just oh, constantly shit. worrying. But apparently that was like a way of relieving some of the stress. It's like the slap bet in uh, How I Met Your Mother. Instead of taking the ten slaps immediately, now, yeah. you took the three slaps over, over like a period of whenever the rest went. of your life. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about the man's reputation. Richard Gordon describes Liston as the fastest knife in the West End. He could amputate a leg in two and a half minutes. Indeed, he is reputed to have been able to complete operations in a matter of seconds at a time when speed was essential to reduce pain and improve the odds of survival of a patient. So you know what that um, idea is, right? We didn't have any anesthetics. Yeah. So if you're getting your leg chopped off, you want it done. You want it over like now. Yeah. Like as soon as it starts, let's get it done. Like, so it you wanted a fast surgeon. Um, well, you know they also like they looked like barbers. They they wore bloody aprons and stuff, and they didn't even look. They didn't clean up. They didn't do any of that when they didn't know about germs. They were just like, in their eyes, blood on the apron was a sense of like a badge of honor. Yeah. Like you show that you've been through a lot of surgeries. This guy has experience. I want him as my doctor, even though his hands are all bloody. And, you know, it's crazy how he didn't get sick, even though he did wash some of his utensils when he was working and like, you know, cutting and chopping off these people's body parts. He's moving so quick that he's putting blades in his mouth and, you know, getting all those germs in there. And he didn't get sick from that. I mean, he died at 53, but it's hard. I mean, that's still pretty old for back then. Uh, did you ever read Travels with Charlie? No, I did not. There's a quote in that book where John Steinbeck says, like, a bad uh, outlook or a bad mood will kill you way faster than any germ. <laughs> That's very true. Like, worry about germs will kill you faster than the germ itself. Well, he's said to be able to perform the removal of a limb and an amputation in 28 seconds. Imagine Damn. me chopping off one of your arms in 28 seconds. Also known to check on patients after to assess physical and emotional stability. So he was very caring in that way too. A lot like Joseph Lister where they cared about their patients. Very few surgeons cared about their patients. There's actually a saying, uh, Lindsay Fitzharris, like I said, I'm going to keep referencing her. Yeah. A lot of my information comes from her book. But uh, the whole idea that like when they were known as go far and go long. Like that was the doctor's excuse when a, like a, the plague broke out. It's like go far and long. Like they, you, you, you go somewhere far away and you stay, you stay away for yeah. a long time. Like doctors were the first one. Once the, the disease starts breaking out, they were cowards. They just ran away. Very few stayed and helped. Like the, uh, the one with the, uh, the doctors, you would see the witch doctors. Yeah. The ones with the giant bird mask type thing. Well, a lot of people don't know, like those those guys were heroes, man. They were For real. Like, during the play. They look creepy as fuck, but actual heroes of just staying just like actually I don't putting even, their own lives aside I to don't help even the say public. They look creepy, man. They look dope, dude. Those little giant, They're cool. Yeah. Like well yeah, you know they had salts inside the mask to help them smell. So, like, if it was a bad stench in, like, a diseased yeah. room, they had that in there to help them breathe. 
but they didn't know a lot about uh contamination either because like they are probably just trapping a lot of that infection in there well in florence nightingale's notes on nursing she states there are many physical operations where sexual is perilous all else being equal the danger is in a different ratio to the time the operation lasts and Sergius Paribus, the operator's success will be in direct ratio to his quickness. Gordon described the scene thus. He was six foot two. This is describing Liston. Um, he was six foot two and operated in a bottle green coat with Wellington boots. He sprung across the blood-stained boards upon his swooning, sweating, strapped down patient like a duelist calling, time me, gentlemen, time me, to students craning with pocket watches, from the iron rangel galleries. Everyone swore that the first flash of his knife was followed so swiftly by the rasp of saw on bone that sight and sound seemed simultaneously. To free both hands, he would clasp the bloody knife between his teeth. Damn, that's a quote from this man describing the scene. That is, sounds like a war hero. <laughs> People would come out to watch these surgeries, much like I told you before. The operating room was a showroom. Um, they basically, and the surgeon was just putting on a performance rather than being a doctor. They were seeing him as a showman. How fast is it going to take Robert Listing <laughs> to chop that boy's leg off? I got free, I got three dollars on four strokes on his leg. I'm sure that actually happened. <laughs> And I, I, his assistant getting his fingers chopped off. I, I got, I got an extra twenty dollar on that one. Yeah, yeah, twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. Gordon's prose and prowess in more than a uh, caricature. He described the link between surgical hygiene and ionic infection was poorly understood at the time. At an address by Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes to the Boston Society for Medical Improvement on the thirteenth of February, eighteen forty-three. His suggestions for hygiene improvement to reduce obsteric infections and mortality from perpetual fever outraged uh, obscurations, particularly in Philadelphia. In those days, surgeons operated in blood-stiffened frock coats. The stiffer the coat, the prouder the busy surgeon. That's when I was telling you about the more blood you had on your jacket. It was seen as a badge of honor. Pus was an inseparable form of surgery as blood. And cleanliness was next to prudishness. So if you actually cleaned your stuff and you were a clean guy, you were seen as a prude. He quotes Sir Frederick Trevis on that era. There was no object in being clean. Indeed, cleanliness was out of place. It was considered to be finicky and affected. Um, an executioner might as well manicure his nails before chopping off a head. Indeed, the connection between surgical hygiene, infection, and mortality rates at Vienna General Hospital was only made in 1847 by Vienna ph physician Dr. Ignis Philip Semmelweis, Semmelweis from Hungary after a close colleague of his died. He instituted the hygiene practices exhorted by Holmes, and the mortality rate fell. So if you read Lindsay Fitzharris' book on the art of butchery, she actually talks about Joseph Lister, Robert Liston, and Semmelweis. And she talks about people, I guess, were called Semmelweis groupies. She's an um, 18th, 19th century medical art historian. So medical historian, like, yeah. she, she's, not, she's not a doctor, even though she has a PhD. She only is... Like, she just knows about all the medical stuff that was used throughout the time period. She's more like a like a doctor of the history, in a way. Yeah. She can't perform surgery, but she can... I mean, I guess anybody can perform surgery. But <laughs> the whole aspect, like, that's... You know, I, I saw him on... I saw her on Joe Rogan's podcast, and that's where, like, I'm obsessed with it. I've listened to this podcast so many times, so a lot of my information is coming from that, too. But Semmelweis, she talks about there's like when she's doing one of these speeches and one of these, she does them in the actual classroom that the operations would happen in. So like a Victorian, imagine your teacher teaching you in the actual scenario they yeah. had for, you know, these operating tables. You know what one of these operating rooms looked like? You've probably seen it in like a Frankenstein movie where there's two guys in like the center of a room and there's seats lined up like a college yeah. type thing and a bunch of people are just watching but there's no seats really. They're standing and there's just like a body thing laying on the table in the middle of the room and they're just watching this guy perform surgery on this kid or whoever their, their patient was at the time. So, the era in which uh, Liston lived 
Gordon states that Liston was an abrupt, abrasive, argumentative man, unfallingly charitable to the poor and tender to the sick, who was lively, unpopular, and his fellow surgeons at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. So, even though he was abrasive, abrupt, and, you know, basically a get-to-the-point type of guy, I think he might have ADHD. Because you got to think, a lot of people that have ADHD are, like, quick to the point. Like, hurry yeah. up, what are you talking, come on, let's get, let's get moving, let's get moving, let's get moving. Like, that's me, for sure. And, uh, but he cared about the people, man. And a lot, I, can you believe other surgeons looked at him at fault for that? Like, you're an idiot. You care about your patients. <sighs> it's a product of that time. Like, it's such a we- That's what, that entire Victorian era, era it's like, fucking, like, the, the morality of that time. Like, the human life wasn't that valuable then. Very morbid time to live in. Well, yes. not very caring, very cold. It, it's first of all, it's it's hard to see warmth in the world when uh, we live with such com- comfortability yeah. nowadays. It's hard to look back and think like these people went through this. Be like, yeah, just be happy we're at medically where we're at now. Yeah. Imagine you break your leg and you got to get you chopped off. Well, I guess I'm not gonna be able to ride my new bike anymore. <laughs> you just get a bike, fall off of it, break your leg. Your dad's shit. like, oh, shit. At least I kept the receipt. <laughs> Well, and he basically, uh, he released Operating Successful um, in the reeking tenements of the grass market and law market on patients that had discharged as hopelessly incurable. So he was the one that would take in the people that were known as incurable. They conspired to bar him from the wards, banished him south where he became professor of surgery at the University of College Hospital and he made a fortune. He actually killed a child to prove the boy had a uh, and like a, one of those, um, what are those, something in your cartoid artery, it's like a aneurysm, yeah, an aneurysm and a cartoid artery in a heated argument within a um, colleague. So just to prove in a heated argument with a colleague, he killed a child to prove that he was right. Listen. Jesus. That's one thing where we might uh, be a little bit like, hey, he didn't seem like he was all out for his fellow man. But like I said, he's abrupt, abrasive, and an argumentative man. You know, he's unfallingly to his characteristics. So he was like, look, I'm going to prove I'm right. Kid, sorry, you got to die. I got to prove to this. The kid's probably going to die anyway. You got to think you have an aneurysm in a yeah. cartoid artery. You're probably dead. I mean, your cartoid artery, that's in your heart, I'm pretty sure. So like, yeah, you're dead. That's not something. I don't. I mean, if you're getting your, if you, if you have a sprained leg and you're getting it chopped off, you know. I don't think it's that far to diagnose. We can treat, we can treat that. We can treat that. No, we can't. Kid's dead. Kid's dead guy. Well, writings on Liston is portrayed as a man of strong character and ethics, which was the source of some of his confrontational style. In one case, he confronted a medical colleague, Dr. Robert Knox, over the treatment of a young woman named Mary Patterson, who it later transpired and was murdered, with Knox thought complicit in the murder. She was in Knox's dissecting rooms within four hours of her death and kept in a whiskey for three months before dissection, during which time she was essentially on display. Liston's response is documented in a letter from him. According to Liston, he saw Mary Patterson's body in Knox's room and immediately suspected foul play. He knocked down Knox after an altercation in front of his students. Liston assumed some students had slept with her when she was alive and that they, that they, would, they should dissect her body offended his sense of decency. He removed her body for burial. He was very confrontational with his medical fellows who have denounced him or was um, bad at treating a patient. First of all, Liston was a very, very particularly good surgeon. He was over and just trying to get the pain over as quick as possible. But when we talk about the Bjork and Hare murders, there's this guy, Robert Knox. So imagine there's another surgeon out there that's doing a treatment that is kind of compared to you in a way. So you're like, I'm going to go see this guy. You're kind of already having problems. He's been talking a little bit of trash on you. He's like the coming up star. So imagine, you're a famous surgeon, this guy coming up talking trash on you, trying to take your spotlight in a way. So you go to view one of his surgeries, and you notice there was a girl that was missing four months now, and she's lying on the table in front of him. And he's performing surgery on this dead body cadaver to show his students. Doesn't that suspect, doesn't that sound suspect? It sounds... This sounds like a fucking play, you know? This sounds like a character in a play. Well, Robert Knox... This kind of man 
a man like kind of out of time, you know, like very forward thinking. Someone who very would Sherlock Holmesy. Yeah, exactly like Sherlock Holmes. Well, Robert Knox actually worked with the Burke and Hare murderers, and this is actually where the belief that Jack the Ripper was a surgeon because of the tools he used are the same ones that were used in surgeries. So Robert Knox would get the bodies from these 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 Bjork and Hare guys that were going around stealing all these um, types of uh, like corpses and also killing people. And Liston walked into this room and saw this woman that had been missing for four months and be like, that's her. And then he had the courage to confront the doctor about yeah, it. Yeah, like, And then not, didn't even call him out about it, just grabbed the body and being, like, and just walked away with it, like, pulled her out of there, like, to save the decency of this woman that had been murdered. And, like, what, he buried her and everything. He did all that stuff. Like, that's seen as, in the eyes of, like, that's a good moral thing. This, the, like, I would say it sounds like a TV show or movie, but it, it sounds like, like, what you're fucking... Recorder sitting on. It sounds like a Shakespeare play or something. Yeah. Like, this sounds like a character out of, like, a novel, not like a real historical figure. Well, Liston's first. Let's talk about while Liston was pioneering contributions or paid tribute with popular cultures such as Richard Gordon and their best-known medical fraternity and related disciples. So Liston became the first professor of clinical surgery at the University College in London in 1835. He also performed the first operation in Europe under modern anesthesia using ether on 21 December 1846 at the University College Hospital. His comment at the time, this Yankee Dodge beats Mes- Mesmerum Hollow, referring to the first use of ether by, ether by doctors in the United States. The first operation using ether as an anal- a- anesthetic was by William T.G. Morton on 16th of October, 1847, in the Massachusetts General Hospital. So you know what ether is? No. It's like a very, 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 very powerful drug. It kind of makes you, like, insensible. So, like, you don't feel anything. You're just Shit. numb. And, like, apparently there's still... Uh, Lindsay Fitzharris talks about it. It's called an ether cocktail. You're, it's like a little thing that dissipates quickly. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to, like, drop it on a strawberry and then dip it in champagne and, like, do it that way. And it, like... It makes you, like, able to, like, uh... But they would apply it to your skin and stuff, too. And that was, like, a type of anesthetic. Like, so you don't feel the pain. It just numbs it. Like, imagine... You know when your hand falls asleep and it's numb? Yeah. But it's... You can still kind of feel it. Imagine it being like that, but you don't get that sleep feeling. It's just, like, your hand's numb. You can't move it. It's you can't not there. Like that. Yeah, it's like everything's like, okay, well... Bam, I could slam it right on the table and it wouldn't hurt. Talk about improving survival rates of amputations. That's Damn. definitely a big medical uh, pioneer thing right there. Well, he invented also see-through Isinglass sticking plaster, bulldog's forceps, it's a type of locking artery forceps, and a leg splint used to stabilize dislocations and fractures of the femur that we still use today. So those things you see where people clip arteries to stop them from bleeding so you can work surgically on them, that was a Liston invention. So Liston's most famous cases, this is my favorite part. Although Richard Gordon's 1983 book pays tribute to other aspects of Liston's character and his legacy is noted elsewhere in this article, its description of some of Liston's most famous cases which had primarily made its way into what is known as Liston popular culture. Gordon describes Liston's four most famous cases in his book as quoted verbatim below. Fourth most famous case. Removal in four minutes of a 45-pound scrotal tumor whose owner had to carry it around in a wheelbarrow. Okay. 45. 45 pound scrotal tumor. He did that in four minutes. Jesus. I definitely want a guy with a knife probably getting it done as fast as possible near my uh, screw. Yeah. Uh, his third most famous case. Argument with a house surgeon was the red pulsating tumor in a small boy's neck, a straightforward abscess of the skin, or a dangerous aneurysm of the cataroid artery. Poo. Liston exclaimed impatiently, whoever heard of an aneurysm in one so young, flashing a knife from his waistcoat pocket. He lanced it, Houseman's note, out leaped arterial blood, and the boy fell. The patient died, but the artery lives in University College Hospital Pathology Museum, specimen number 12,056. So that's the boy he killed. An aneurysm, that is when... 
Well, an aneurysm it, can be like a cyst too, like a, like a giant like size swelled up lump. So that, that's one like a pocket of. It's like a pocket of blood basically okay. swelled up. I'm not too sure on the medical aspects All of right. it, but like a lot of people get aneurysms in their brain, and it causes like a, if you don't catch it or something, you, it basically yeah. kills you. Um, you can also live with an aneurysm your whole life and not have it affect you. Well. The second most famous case, he amputated a leg in two and a half minutes, but his enthusiasm, the patient's testicles as well. <laughs> so he removed a leg so fast that he also cut off the patient's testes. What do you just tell the, hey, I'm going to chop your left leg off so don't have your testicles hanging on your left side of your Jesus. leg, hang out, hanging on the right. Your right or my right? Oh, God. Okay, Liston's most famous case. So, amputated the leg in under two and a half minutes. The patient died afterwards in the ward from hospital gangrene. They usually did those in the pre-Listerian days. He amputated in addition to this woman's leg. He, the fingers of his young assistant, who died afterwards in the ward from hospital gangrene, and he also slashed through the coattails of a distinguished surgical specter who was so terrified that the knife had pierced his vitals, he dropped dead from fright. That was the only operation in history with a 300% mortality rating. He killed three people in one surgery. One, okay, you kind of knew it was going to die, but his assistant's fingers, and then his assistant dies of contamination. Like I said, if you got a cut on your finger, you got something chopped off, it was an open blood contamination, you were done, dude. Like, that was it. It wasn't until Joseph Lister, who hopefully we'll talk about eventually, that, uh, you know, when he started creating all this stuff in modern medicine, it was better ways to develop, like, cleanliness and cleaningness. And he actually was the one that noticed that if a cut is left open and not treated or covered up properly, you got infected from the contamination outside, not from the initial cut. Everyone thought you got hurt from the cut or from the bullet or whatever the hell you were just that pierced the skin. Really, it was the open contamination. Liston figured that out. Lister. Robert Lister. Or not I'll Robert Lister. Joseph Lister. You've added a, like, character into my brain, you know? <laughs> He's definitely someone you want to think about. Yeah, like, all that... You think about Martin Luther King, I'm thinking about Robert Lister. Yeah, like, don't suffer a coward Robert Liston. In, in the medical profession. Dude, I like, get those two mixed up so bad. Robert Liston and Joseph Lister. Lister, it's, Liston, yeah. Yeah, it's too damn close. Yeah, like, not... Two different not... guys, too. I literally thought I was reading the same guy, dude. I was like, is this the same dude? Like... <sighs> Like, actually sounds like a hero from a story. Like, not maybe not a hero, but a anti-hero of sorts, maybe. Like, a, pro a, a, Bill a Billy the Kid. Definitely a protagonist, you know? Well, hopefully I educated some people on the aspect of Robert Liston, and somebody can uh, look him up, you know, because he was a giant medical inspiration um, in this time period where, you know, we're, we got to think, what would we do without <laughs> anesthetics now? What would you do if you had to go get your leg chopped off because you broke it? And then you couldn't be numbed by pain. we got to be happy that exists. Everything that we've done medically, you know, how far we can treat cancer. We can literally stop, like, a tumor or a cancer or change a genetic defect in a pregnancy before it even occurs so the kid doesn't have to deal with that. That's a big lifesaver. Where people talk about things that we're doing unethically wrong in medical, think about all the good stuff we're doing correctly. That's a good fucking topic, my dude. <laughs> I picked a good one. Yeah. Well, anybody else that wants to look up Robert Liston, give him a give him a little look and uh, check out Lindsay Fitzharris' book, The Art of Butchery. It's definitely something. It's going to be a it, a good read for sure. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to this episode of Fill in the Blank, and stay tuned for our next episode.